Can I get a big amen, church? I mean, today the music has been really rich. Praise God. Praise God for all the musicians. The mics are sounding good. Thank you all, your visual, for your great work. Thank you, Linden family, for your prayers and your support. Amen? Happy Sabbath, church. How are we doing today? We're good? We're happy in Jesus? We're praising God? Hallelujah. It's because of what he has done while we're here today. We're alive. As Christine was sharing, you know, my mind just went back to losing my sister as well. But I'm thankful. I'm praising God nonetheless. Amen. Because God is still God. In the good times and the bad times. In the sad times and the happy times. He is still God. And because he's God, he's worthy to be praised. So no matter what you're going through, beloved, praise God and give him thanks. I know Lyndon is going through a phase at this time. But be assured that God is in control. Amen? God is with his people. I want you to trust him. Amen? Amen? Trust God. What did I say, beloved? Trust God. Whatever you're going through, trust God. And he will see us through. I'm going to do something a little different this morning, and I'm going to trouble my friends on the balcony mainly my young folks. Is it okay, church? We have a number of spaces down here. So I'm just going to invite you to come a little closer. Come down a little closer and worship with us. I would like to see you. Just two weeks ago, I'm just going to tell you this while you're coming. Two weeks ago, I decided to go and see the optometrist. I'm not that old. The eye doctor. After my eye exam, he told me that my vision is what he considers functional. Mercy. <laughs> but after he fitted a pair of glasses, I was able to see much clearer. But he also warned me, he said, be careful of all that you're now able going to see. As you're now going to be able to see the parishioners who are sleeping during your sermon. So be warned, I can see you down there. All the way to the back. I see you, hello, Kevin. I see you. I know you're not going to sleep, but I see you. <laughs> so young people, I'm inviting you to come down as we share in today's message. My house, my rule. My house, my rule invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, again we give you thanks for being such a loving God. We thank you, oh God, because it's through your mercies why we're not consumed. So as we come before your awesome presence, we ask God that you will manifest yourself today in a marked and marvelous way. I ask God that you will hide me behind the cross of Calvary. And may Jesus Christ be seen and be lifted up. Bless each worshiper today. Because God, we indeed will worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. I know some of you may have 
traveled to Jamaica and uh, during your shopping, you may have seen a little ornament that you can put in your kitchen or your living room which reads, my place, my rules. When you come here, what you see here, what you do here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. Or what? You know it. I guess most of you have it. Everywhere you go, there are rules. Thank you, Uncle Tony, for starting off. See how the spirit works? Everywhere there are rules. You can't get away from them. It is said that even in hell there are rules. There are parent-child rules, workplace rules, rules on the road, and there are house rules, just to name a few. Contrary to what many might think, that rules were created for punishment or an hindrance. Rules are indeed a blessing when obeyed. According to Psalm 19, let us read from verse 7 to 11. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 11 says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is what? Great reward. So rules carry benefits. Rules are normally laid down like a governing guide for action or conduct. There are various rules set up for various societies and situations. For instance, the rules for governing an educational institution are different from ones used in sports like cricket or football. For whichever reason rules are set up, they offer significant benefits when followed. Rules are established to create stability, beloved. There are rules in marriages and family affairs. Their rules are for prom promoting or encouraging safety. Rules create discipline. Through setting up of rules and laws for governing the society, discipline is encouraged. People will require adhering strictly to the rules and this promotes harmony within the society. Rules helps to create protection and also happiness. So rules have benefits when adhered to, but consequences follows when they are disobeyed or broken. We know too well Adam and Eve were created by God, placed in the garden of God, Eden, and given instructions and rule. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 says, And the Lord God took the man, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, neither for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. My house, my rules. We know this story. They broke the rules. And we are still dealing with the consequences. 
Many of us often visit family and friends, beloved, or have those loved ones come to visit us in our homes. Over the years, I have learned that most, if not all, hosts have their own set of rules that they expect to be followed by the guest that enters their home. Some expect visitors to remove their shoes before stepping one foot on their plush ivory-colored carpet. There are hosts that want everyone's coat hang neatly in the front hall closet or on the coat rack near the door. There are some homeowners only allow eating in the dining room during special occasions. And at other times, the kitchen is a shared eating space. Some hosts ask or even require that guests bring a dish when attending their dinner parties. And then there is the occasional make yourself at home and you don't have to take off your shoes type of hose. That one was like my mother. She only cares that you made it safely. One thing is for sure, beloved, there are specifics for each person's home and you that you visit, and I'm sure you have your own unwritten rules that you expect guests to follow as well. Rules also for our children. Boyfriend, girlfriend rules. School week rules. No sleepover during school night. And curfew rules. Make sure you're home before 10 o'clock. We're instructed in the commandment that children should obey their parents in the Lord. For this is right. What can I say? We must obey our parents. Rules are as we were told growing up. If you're not going to obey my rules in this house, find your own place. And create your own rules. Might I declare, beloved, that the house of God also has rules. The house of God also has rules that he expects us to follow upon entering into his courts. And his rules are clearly written. Yes, God is the ultimate host and welcomes all. But he has specifics for how we should come before him. He even told Psalmist David in Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All he lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Yeah. Know he that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastors. Verse 4 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. My house my rules, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generation. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, beloved, and into his courts with praise. This isn't a suggestion but a command that we are to follow. And if we don't, we are basically disrespecting the host. We are expected to enter God's house with a praise and with a heart of gratefulness. When we cross the threshold of the house of God, we must be purposeful in our actions, what we do and what we are offering to him. Ellen White admonishes us, in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 492, says, Entering God's house. When the worshipers enter the place of meeting, they should do so with decorum, passing quietly to their seats. If some have to wait a few minutes before the meeting begins, let them maintain a true spirit of devotion by silent meditation, keeping the heart uplifted to God in prayer that the service may be a special 
benefit to their own hearts and to lead to conviction and conversion of other souls. We must recognize that our etiquette or custom when entering into worship, it sets the tone for our visit or time with our Savior. Just as we honor the special requests of our gracious hosts when we visit their homes, we are to honor God even more because he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Here are some more house rules. Take off your shoes, not literally, but when we walk into God's house, we should acknowledge that we have stepped on the holy ground. God told Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 5, he said, he, and he said, draw not nigh hither. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Put off your shoes off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And we should also remove the mask, beloved. The Lord knows us even more than we know ourselves. We are transparent before him. We are not here just for fellowship, which is horizontal, but more so for worship, which is vertical. Another point, beloved, is we should hang our coat in the closet. When you take off your coat, naturally it lifts somewhat of a weight from your shoulders, especially during the winter, coats are heavy. David says in Psalm 55, 22, he says, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Take off that coat, that burden, and let the Lord hang or handle it for you so that you may worship and praise him freely. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The next point, my, my friends, is bring a dish. In this instance, your dish is the worship that you offer unto the Lord. And just like taking a dish to a friend's dinner party, you should take your best. Even if you're only asked to bring the paper plates, the cups, and the napkins. John 4, 23 says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Beloved, let us be careful how we treat the things and the places dedicated to God. Let us keep his house clean, free from torn paper, water bottles and the likes. Whatever it is, Make sure that it is representing the God of the universe. The way we behave and treat the house of our host reflects how much we value the host. And then White continues to tell us, when the word is spoken, you should remember, brethren, that you are listening to the voice of God through his delegated servant. She says, listen attentively. To our senior, she says, sleep not for one instant, because by this slumber you may lose the very words that you need most, the very words which, if heeded, would save your feet from straying into wrong paths. She warns that Satan and his angels are busy creating a paralyzed condition of the senses so that cautions, warnings, and reproofs shall not be heard. And if heard, they shall not take effect upon the heart and reform the life. Her message to us who have young children, 
He says, sometimes a little child may so distract the attention of the hearers that the precious seed does not fall into good ground and bring forth fruit. Then her message to our youth. She says, sometimes young men and women have so little reverence for the house and worship of God that they keep up a continual communication with each other during the sermon. She said, could these see the angels of God looking upon them and marking their doings, they would be filled with shame, with abhorrence of themselves. She says, God wants attentive hearers. She finished by saying that it was while men slept that Satan sowed tears. Beloved, we must be aware of the unquestionable presence of the invisible God. According to one Robert Harris, the associate professor of Bible and Asian Semitic language, in an article, Why God Needs a Dwelling Place, he writes, he says, God does not need an earthly sanctuary for his dwelling. But in his wisdom created such a system which was for man's benefit. He says, Professor Harris also shared the comment of a 19th century European exegete named Malbin, who took a moralistic approach to the idea of God's dwelling place. He said, rather than contemplating an actual physical place of worship, he suggests that each one of us needs to build God a tabernacle in the recesses of our hearts. By preparing oneself to become a sanctuary for God and a place for the dwelling of God's glory. He interprets God's promise to make a dynasty for David to mean that God said that David himself should become a tabernacle for God. Thus, it should be for all generations. Each one should build a tabernacle in the innermost recesses of the heart and prepare an altar upon which to offer up, as it were, all aspects of oneself to God's service. Therefore, my brothers and my sisters, while it is extremely important for us to reverence the sanctuary, the house of God, it would like, I would like to shift our attention to the word in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, which states, You also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Acts 17, 24 also adds to this. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made by hands. Verse 25 says, neither is worship with man's hand as though he needed anything, seeing he give it to all life and breath and all things. In the Old Testament, Exodus 25 verse 8, God commanded Moses to build him a sanctuary where he might dwell. Because, beloved, God always seeks to dwell with his people. But now, when we talk about the dwelling place of God or the church, we must be aware that it's not just a building or a place of worship, but rather the church, ecclesia, is the people. I am talking about you and you and you and you and me. And your heart is the habitation of God. God himself tells us, even though he dwelt in the physical tabernacle in the Old Testament, no longer lives in temples built by hands. So it wouldn't matter how much stained glass, marble, or gold we adorn this building with. 
it, God doesn't live in it. But according to what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, we are his house. We are the vessel in which God dwells. Wherefore I go, I go to wherever I go, beloved, the church goes. Wherever I am, that's where the church is. But let's not be hasty now. The thing that we no longer need to assemble ourselves together. But a message today is to cancel a thought. When you come to church and I come to church and we come together on God's holy Sabbath, this is a meeting place for a holy convocation and the glory of God will fill this place, beloved. God brings us all together. He brings those who are broken and bruised. He brings those who are weary and tired. He brings all of us into this meeting place. And together as the body of God, we glorify the Lord for what he has done. And we lift up his mighty name because he is who he says he is. And he will never change, beloved. Our part in this is that we determine to be obedient to his call. While some may be asking God to settle for just anything, I believe God wants to work a mighty work in us to establish and build a beautiful house for his dwelling place. He deserves nothing less. Now, we are also told that unless God builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. In other words, unless the house is constructed according to his standard, his specification, his order, and his blueprint, then we are merely wasting our time. Because God never lives in a house that he has not built. But he wants to live with us. And he wants to live in us. I want to see God's house established in me. And I want to see God's house established in you. So that the Jesus in me will see this Jesus in you. And together as one happy family, we'll be able to unite in this journey called Christianity. We'll be able to unite on this journey to the kingdom of God. I'm going to share some more of this next Sabbath. So I'm going to leave some of this until then. Let me hasten on to the end of this message. There is an interesting difference between being in the house of God and being the house of God. Jesus understood the difference. In the book of John and Matthew, we find the account of Jesus entering the temple of God and found those who bought and sold oxen and sheep and dove and the changes of money. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes of money and overthrew the temple, the, the tables. The Bible says they wanted to make the house of God, a den of thieves. But Jesus knew the purpose for which God has designed his house. It is a house of prayer. There's a text, John 2 and verse 17, the disciples remembered that it was written, 
The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. There is a marked difference, beloved, between going to church and being the church. Going to church can become just a chore, a task, or an activity, a place for social gathering, or a place just for religious obligation. But being the church is a privilege honor to carry the incorruptible seed of God, a place for corporate worship, and a place to foster the growth of an intimate relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul to the Corinthians believers says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. That's what we're going to talk about next week. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. When you are the church, beloved, Jesus will change your doubts to beliefs. According to Ezekiel 11 verse 19, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes. And keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. When you are the church, beloved, Jesus will change your fears into faith. He will change your defeats into victory. When you are the church, beloved, your despairs will be changed into triumphs your pain into laughter, and your sorrows will change into joy. Amen. Beloved, when you are the church, God turns every problem into a platform for growth. When you are the church, God turns every obstacle into a stepping stone. When you are the church, beloved, every challenge becomes an opportunity to shine for Jesus. Jesus had a zeal, beloved. Do we have a zeal today for God's house? Do we have a zeal for the things of God? Those of old, it says they had a zeal. One named Anna the prophetess. It says she departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and and day. It is says that Martin Luther, he prayed three times, three hours rather, per day. Do we have a zeal for God, beloved? Those who are martyred for their faith, it says they wore their fetters as ornaments. They snatched up torments as crowns and embraced the flames as cheerfully as Elijah did the fiery chariot that came to fetch him to heaven. One Ignatius says, let rocks, fires, pulleys, and all manner of torment come, so I may win Christ. The very conditions now prevailing in the world constitute a call to prayer, beloved. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The fire of spiritual power that light the earth with gospel glory and finishes God's work are cut short in righteousness will be kindled in the assembles of praying saints 
who have learned to experience the joys of answered prayer. Beloved, baby prayers won't get breakthroughs. Let me say that again. Baby prayers won't get breakthroughs. James tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avail it much. Let us not crowd every day with programs and forget to pray. I challenge you today, beloved, to give God one uninterrupted hour each day in prayer. Alone with God. There's a song that says, not my mother, not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The same spirit, beloved. That was in Jesus Christ is available to us today. God is able to do the impossible through you and through me. But he has to first do the impossible in you and in me. He must change us. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Verse 15 says, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. God is saying today, my friends, this is my house. These are my rules. He's asking us to be obedient because there is a reward for the obedient. Revelation 3 and verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Beloved, we have always encouraged you to believe in God. But today, I'm going to encourage you to trust in God. The Bible says that the devil believed and trembled. Judas Iscariot, he also believed. He believed Jesus for who he was. But he didn't trust him for his salvation. So today, I'm encouraging you, I'm asking you, and imploring you to trust in God. Do you trust God today? Do you trust God to take care of all your problems? Do you trust him to supply all your needs? Do you trust God to save you? Stand to your feet with me if that is your conviction today. I'm going to invite the praise team to sing the appeal song, We Are Standing on Holy Ground. But I'm also going to invite the prayer ministry's leader, Sister Eccles, and her team to come and join me on the platform, along with elders Lionel Williams, Rolaine Antoine, and Elder Gay Downer. I invite you to come on the platform with me at this time. But beloved, we have heard the call. 
a call to trust God. I don't know what you are faced with in your life right now. But I'm inviting you to come and put God to the test. Prove him today. Because his promises are sure. He said, if you call on me, I will answer you. So whatever you are going through, my friends, I'm inviting you to come and tell it to Jesus. Come and lay it all on the altar of sacrifice. You may be going through depression. Come. You may be going through anxiety. Come. You may be going through financial crisis. Come. Whatever it is. It is not bigger than God. Amen. I don't think you heard me, beloved. Amen. Whatever you are dealing with, it could be cancer. It is not bigger than God. Right. It could be diabetes. It is not bigger than God. It could be wayward children. That situation is not bigger than God. Trust God today to hear the cry of your heart. Trust God today to stand by his word. He's a God who cannot lie. Whatever he says, that he will do. I want you to come believing, trusting, because you know he has done it in the past and he surely can do it again. I'm going to have the elders pray. But while they're praying, I'm encouraging you to also whisper that silent prayer in your heart. Sing for me, priest. We Because of your kindness and your goodness to us, Lord, you have sent us a message needed for this time. A message to present ourselves as living sacrifices where, dear Lord, you can dwell and make known to men and women everywhere that Jesus saves. We thank you, Lord, for this message. And we want to Obey the rules that you've outlined for our good. And so, dear Lord, where we have fallen, we repent, dear Lord. We are sorry that we have taken your word for granted. We are sorry that we have come into your courts in a nonchalant way, ways that do not represent your holiness. We repent, dear Lord, where we have not spent time enough in prayer. Now, dear Lord, we want to make a change in our lives. We have heard your word. We want to turn around, and we want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And those who have gone before us, dear Lord, who have led the way of prayer, who have traveled through pain and tribulations just to be closer to you, we thank you for this moment. And we ask, O oh, gracious Lord, that you will help that we would be a living temple for Christ. 
so that you will be able to come in and shine forth, pointing men and women to the holy ground where Christ dwells. Thank you, Father, for this message again, we pray, as we continue in these prayers. Father, you have made manifest your presence in the tabernacle that you have established in us. You have come into our midst so that we may worship you with our heart, our mind, and our prayers. Oh, God of unity, you sent your son to die for us, to unify us unto you. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your love that abounds in us. May we share it with each other. May we shine so, so others may see the light of your glory. Bring your children together in one, as one. May your unity be felt in the presence of you and in your tabernacle. Let us take this unity back home and be unified at home. May your love shine through us as we go into our places of work. Oh, Lord, may everyone see in us something so different because you have taken us unto you. Your trinity abounds yes. through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. You are amazing, Lord, and we love you. Thank you for taking us into your embrace, for we feel your amazing grace. And, Father, you are a God of abundance, and we feel it manifold and manifested. Thank you for all the things that you have given us so plentiful. You are indeed a God of abundance because we feel your love, your joy, and your presence. We continue to pray you for many things, but we also thank you and are so grateful for your presence. Can I woman forget your second child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yes, she may forget, but you, God, will not forget us. We come to give thanks unto you and to praise you because your mercy endure forever. We thank you for sustaining us through our challenges. We thank you for affording us the privilege to allow yourself to live in us, making our bodies the temple. We praise you, Almighty God. We acknowledge you, we lift you up, and we magnify your name because you are God all by yourself. And we just want to say thank you. Your children got up from their seats, walked down here in response to an appeal. They come, dear God, with penitence. And in the name of Jesus, I ask you to take them right now. Help them first to take you at your word. And I pray, Almighty God, that as we come before you, we will empty ourselves of everything which is unlike you. And may this message, God, be so real in our hearts, in our lives, so that the change may be evident. And God, when we leave this place today, help us to always remember that you are living in us. Father God, we thank you for our prayer warriors of this church. We ask you to bless them as they continue to intercede on our behalf. As they stand right here today, I ask you, God, to strengthen them. Give them courage. And I pray, God, that those of us who are standing, help us to always remember when we come into your courts, we are standing on holy ground. Thank you for this message today. Thank you for this messenger. Bless him, we pray. And keep us together and save us, we pray, for Christ's sake.
Let us look to the Lord. Loving and eternal Father, we thank you for the word that was delivered to this congregation at this time. Being omnipresent, you knew that word needed to be delivered for such a time as this. And so, Lord, we open our hearts and we open our minds, Lord. We just don't want to be in church, but we want to be the church not confined to these four walls, but going out into the world and reflecting the light and the love that you have for us into a world that is clamoring, that is begging to get to know you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the messenger. I thank you for the, all those who were able to bring forth items of praise to you. And now, Lord, as we go forth into the rest of your Sabbath, Lord, I ask that you continue to dwell with us, send your angels among us, and allow us to be able to come convene next Sabbath again in your temple, your house of worship and prayer. This is my son's name. This is my prayer in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 